Hi there. Thank you for coming to this talk. Thank you, Open Source Bridge, for being amazing. Um, so this is the Outreach Program for Women, What Works and What's Next. This is Liz Henry. Hi, I'm Liz. She is the bug master for Mozilla. She runs bug-related processes. And I am Sumana Hariharishwara, and I work at the Wikimedia Foundation, the nonprofit that keeps Wikipedia going as senior technical writer. Up until recently, I was the open source community manager. But we are not really here in our professional capacities. I am not speaking for Wikipedia. You are not speaking for I, Firefox no, or I'm Mozilla. No, I'm not speaking for Mozilla. I might not be speaking for anyone. <laughs> We're not even really speaking for OPW. Even We're not. We kind of are. No, no. But we don't run the program. Let's hit next. We're just mentors. Just. Next. Um, here's our agenda. This is the part where we tell you what we're going to tell you. Um, we want to give you a little outline of what OPW is, um, Outreach Program for Women, and um, um, its background. Uh, and then talk about some things that we think work well that you could take from that and apply to other projects, maybe even your project. And then we also wanted to leave off a uh, question and answer, uh, not do question and answer period at the end, but instead set up a Friday chat time to have a roundtable discussion. There's so many people in this room and at OSB who we want to have some perspectives on some important questions, but we're just going to set that up today. Right. I didn't actually set a time for that. We're going to figure that we'll out figure on the Friday unconference. Excellent. Yeah. So who we are and who we're not. So um, I introduced. OPW at Wikimedia. That is to say, because Outreach Program for Women involves lots of different open source projects, I was the one who got Wikimedia involved and got our first Outreach Program for Women interns involved. So I have administered our OPW involvement, and I have been an OPW mentor, and I am mentoring an OPW intern right now. I am also currently in this semi-official role as OPW's career development advisor. That is to say, I'm the one who's kind of obsessed with there being a ramp after the internship to help those interns uh, figure out how they can parlay OPW into the next thing they want in their career, their education, their life. Liz? My phone is ringing. Sorry. Liz's okay. phone is ringing. Because um, she's just, popular. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I got involved with um, OPW in 2013 because I was working for Mozilla and some other folks asked me if I would mentor, uh, if I would sign up to be a mentor. Um, so I did mentor one person in doing um, bug triage and community work. So sort of half technical and half developing tutorials and events. Um, that was uh, Tatiana Salido, who was awesome and is still involved with Mozilla um, QA and bug triage work. Um, and then this year, I am also involved as a mentor um, with um, Maya. Um, oh, no, I just forgot how to say your last name. <laughs> Free to which? <laughs> yes. Um, and um, uh, who's working on a Python Django tool. And um, uh, Francesca Ciceri, um, who's also doing bug triage and community work. I want to mention who we're not which is to say we do not run OPW the thing. There is a person here in the third row wearing a uh, yeah. sea green. T Thank you, Marina, for running OPW. Yep. <laughs> Marina Jurinskaya works for Red Hat. Marina Jurinskaya runs the outreach program for women. Um, she has been and is, it continues to be uh, helped by Karen Sandler, who up until recently was the executive director of the GNOME Foundation. And I'm very grateful to her and to the GNOME Foundation for starting and running this program. But I just want to mention, so we're not speaking for OPW. We're just giving you our experiences as mentors and people interested in this. Let's talk about the origin story of OPW, which is to say that in the mid-2000s, Google started Google Summer of Code, an internship program, and GNOME was unhappy because, at least in one year, they got 181 GSEC applicants and none of them were women. So this is the original flyer for the GNOME Women's Summer Outreach Program. At this point, you may have noticed that some of these slides seem to have been professionally done and actually have GNOME branding. Some of them do not. That is because Marina was kind enough. 
Oh, and Karen, Karen. was kind enough to uh, give us some GNOME branded slides for their super official, what is OPW and how you can help thing. And then we, in a sort of punk rock zine-esque fashion, are interspersing it with extremely like lo-fi, fixie bike style slides that we made about our perspectives. <laughs> in, um, so they started this program and at the time, or, or let's say just after they did it, Guadec 2009, 5% women. That was, that's the yearly conference for GNOME. That's all right. Um, so uh, that, uh, as you, I don't know if you can see, but yes, there's not that many women in this particular picture for the yearly conference. So they st uh, this is a better flyer for the, uh, it was the flyer that we used to advertise the current round of OPW. And there are a bunch of participants who have passed through the program uh, as alums with a bunch, I'm not going to read all these. It's just, look, a lot of open source programs. Yours could be one of them. Get on the bandwagon. And part of that is because the program is structured so that the participating organizations um, help fund the, the internship to, to pay the interns. Um, currently, I did a quick check. Marina could fix me up on the numbers, but I believe that there are about 40 participants participating right now, including some interns who are in this room and at this conference. And we like to, when possible, have more than one mentor per, per student for backup and other reasons. Um, and so I think there's about 64 mentors right now, including some people who are also doing organizational administrative work at places like Mozilla and Wikimedia. Is that about right, this number? Okay. Sure, there's a tilde. The tilde means you can't count on this number. <laughs> <laughs> so we wanted to talk about a little bit about how, how this program is actually attracting applicants. And one way, um, one thing that we think is a excellent pattern for increasing the diversity of your participants in a program is address them directly. Let them know that they're invited. So um, this, uh, the outreach program for women does invite um, women Basically, everyone who's not a cis male guy. Um, address women, cis and trans, and gender queer people directly. Um, We're actually going to go through each of these in more detail. Oh, so I shouldn't slides. read them out. You're right. We have slides for them separately. Yeah, I just wanted to. Yeah. We'll, we'll be oh, yeah. also, you know, in case you want to just send a single slide to someone else later, this will be that slide. <laughs> and then, you know, for actual usage in communicating with people who are in the room with us, we have other slides that are easier to look at. Next. Right on. Yes, based on Google SMR code, but actually a bit different. Um, I did mention the part already, self-funded by the projects who are involved with some help, I think, from GNOME. Um, Non-students are welcome, which is um, fairly crucial um, and is reflected in the stats. You can see still student heavy, but non-students do participate. Um, you want to go on? Sure. Um, I was super jargony here and said FLOSS, meaning free Libra open source software, which is the term you use when you don't want to start a fight with people who are ideologically different from you, but you are fine with completely excluding people who are slightly new to open source and don't but know what that means. But we left out the slash. There should be <laughs> like, like that child. F See, slash. I've made that child See. angry. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> what were you going to say? That's okay. Yeah. So um, you d Google Summer of Code, the only projects they allow are coding projects. In, in OPW, we have system administration. We have project management. We have design. We have marketing. We have product management. Um, and we have a number of other things that need doing, that we, and such as release management, that there currently isn't nearly as good a pipeline for, even in our industry, much less open source, as there is for coding. Always try before you buy. Uh, Google Summer of Code, any given open source organization can make it so that, oh, you have to reach out to us first and connect personally with a mentor and submit a small sample task as part of your application or before you apply. In OPW, we actually require it. And I think that's better. I think it's better to make sure people always try before they buy for reasons we'll go into. And then the participants, yeah, we, uh, that, this is another way that it's different from GSOC is that it's everyone but cis men. Next. Not a great way to phrase that, but we. If you have if you, a yeah. clear like one or two <laughs> word phrase for everyone but cis men, please tell us. <laughs> so during the program, this is how the program works in a sense. Um, do you want to go through? Sure. You have a focus time where you can you can work in free software, paid. It's about three months. Um, 
and it isn't also it isn't just the summer I forgot to mention that it's not only just students but we it, it has been run it, that is uh, a key thing we should have put in the not yeah. GSOC slide is that yeah. it also <laughs> works during the southern hemisphere summer right which means that people in the southern hemisphere can actually do this during their summer break uh, it is meant to encourage people to the interns to work on manageable projects that they can complete by the end of the internship um, rather than just building a piece of something that uh, uh, that they then leave behind um, it um, requires the participants to blog regularly I think on a weekly or bi-weekly schedule so that there's a public record not just in the um, in the open source project but there's a public record that that of their synthesis of their activities, which I think is really nice. Uh, it also helps let the rest of the open source project know that, that those people are, are contributing. Um, we have an OPW IRC channel. There are specific meetings, isn't there? There's a midway, a mid, midpoint meeting, and then a sort of wrap up meeting. And in addition to that, I've been hosting office hours where people can come in and ask career questions because I am career development advisor. And I am discovering that part of my job as career development advisor is to review resumes, which I kind of knew. Um, part of it is just to give people general advice on uh, applying to jobs such as, yeah, go ahead and apply to jobs when you only have 60% of the required bullet points. That's fine. Um, and I think that the IRC channel is really nice because you have, of course, you have open channels of communication for the project itself that you're working in, but you also have a back channel of people in a similar situation to you who you can, you can bounce ideas around with. And the applicants are also welcome in that channel. Yeah. Um, so they can get a taste. Again, try before you buy. And the travel sponsorship. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, sure. There's a part of the, the funding is earmarked for travel. That's about all. It's just meant to let you help you get a face to face connection with people you're working with. Uh, can I? Um, the OPW travel stipend is somewhat new and it's certainly newly publicized. Yeah, it existed last year. Um, yes, I said somewhat new. Somewhat new. Okay. This thing has been going on for years. <laughs> and so we iterate and improve all the time. Yep. Okay, and so then after the program, people who were in the program become alumni. I think that's how you say the plural of alumna. Um, and uh, they often continue working with their mentors. Um, they often pursue other free software opportunities. Sometimes they move on from one program into, uh, from one open source project into another open source project. I saw a great, uh, I saw a great blog post by someone who had been involved a lot with Debian and was now doing a bunch of Mozilla work, I think through OPW, and was basically like, hey folks, here's what Debian does better on this. Here's what Mozilla does better on this. We all should learn from each other. That's exactly the kind of knowledge sharing that open source can really use. Um, alums present at conferences. Uh, I believe that we have uh, at least one probably presenting here at OSB, although I yeah. can't remember who. Uh, Naharika? Oh, Francis, Francis is, is currently doing an internship, <laughs> your so she's your not intern. alum, but yeah, like Naharika, I think. Uh, no, yeah. she did a GSOC. Anyway, sorry, but uh, we have some stats later about a lot of conference presentations. Um, they become mentors in Google and Summer of Code and OPW and just generally informally. They answer questions in IRC, in mailing lists. They spread the word about open source, about these projects, and they value and understand free software even if they move on to something else. One story I heard uh, probably third hand, is a woman who went through OPW has now been hired into proprietary tech and is not contributing actively any code to free software anymore, but she hosts a podcast. And when she's talking on that podcast about software, she often mentions free software. It's part of her discourse. She understands what we're up to and under what circumstances the trade-offs uh, say, hey, you should be using free software here. And I really appreciate that. It works. OPW works. It moves the needle. One reason why I brought Wikimedia into OPW is because for years I've been trying various other tactics to not be the only woman in the room. And I went to the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing and helped worked on, work on the open source hack day there. Um, it wasn't quite the uptick that I wanted in terms of like getting con people continuously involved. Um, I gave like 
13 talks in one day at a women's college to try and to say, hey, you could apply to Google Summer of Code, no effect. Um, and then I saw what had happened with OPW, that number of getting from 5% to 17% women at GNOME, uh, at Guadec, uh, tw the, the GNOME conference of 2013, 18% women attending, 21% women speakers. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that is something that should speak to your project as well. If you want to know, oh, what's actually effective, OPW is effective. Um, the outreach program for women uh, was included, uh, the Linux kernel got involved. And uh, is Sarah Sharp in this room? Yes. So uh, Sarah was just key and pivotal in getting the Linux kernel involved in a, as an OPW project. And so OPW applicants, as part of their application process, wrote patches and wrote drivers. And then when Linux Weekly News did their regular roundup of the stats of who's been contributing to the Linux kernel, Outreach Program for Women made the sort of billboard top 100 and uh, outpaced a few names you might have heard of, um, although maybe not if you're in the back row. There's names here that I'm sure they were just like on vacation or something, IBM, Samsung, and so on. Um, and uh, that was pretty exciting to a lot of us. We were, we were patting ourselves in the back and like giving you high fives via IRC, right? Yeah. All right. So well, yeah, let's talk in general about the accomplishments of some of our alumni. Um, 19 of these have had uh, full session talks at open source conferences. 15 have found employment with the sponsoring organizations. So yes, this is a recruiting pipeline if you want it to be uh, for, for hiring. Uh, 14, by the way, this is just the, as far as we know. Like there might be people who have sort of gone off and founded code schools at McMurdo Station, Antarctica, and never talked to us, but they may have still done things, so. Uh, 14 went on to other FOSS internships or boot camps or other focused FOSS opportunities, such as Google Summer of Code or Hacker School. Um, there's also a Hacker School to OPW pipeline that I have been involved with as a Hacker School alumna. Um, seven became mentors in their orgs. Three have organized local technology groups in Chicago, in Nairobi, in India. And one became a GNOME Foundation board member. So uh, certainly OPW alums are making a difference in code and they're also making a difference on other things that need doing such as governance. So some success stories that aren't necessarily on the official GNOME slide. Uh, one is I'm really happy that some proportion of the OPW participants have been women who have either been on maternity leave and wanted something to do with, let's say, that last trimester of pregnancy that they could do from home flexibly, or women returning to the workforce after spending a lot of time doing childcare. This is exactly the sort of thing that, that really gets me excited. And I think there's probably a few here in the room of uh, people that you can talk to. Uh, if there's someone that people should uh, feel free to talk to maybe after the talk, but don't necessarily, I'm not gonna make you like get up right now and like testify. You wanna raise your hand if you wanna talk about OPW with people? All right, so we have a few over here. <laughs> and, and, and Mindy over there, okay, great. So OPW causes improvements for lots of open source projects. Getting involved in OPW isn't just oh, now there is an increase of one uh, person who is not a cis man in your project. It leads to a bunch of other incredibly beneficial side effects. Do you want to talk about this? Um, uh, yeah, I would say that our list of mentors available in the community has expanded greatly. Um, I don't think I would have stepped up to be a mentor for Google Summer of Code, for example. Um, but I felt, I felt more able to, to say that I could, could step forward for this. What did you mean by newcomer's tutorial? Sorry. Oh, often one creates a newcomer's tutorial. Uh, or brushes one up. Oh and, yeah, you end yeah. up documenting stuff better. Mm -hmm. Yep, in yeah. your project. Uh, you end up uh, identifying your easy and moderate to fix bugs. Um, you you've end up already doing... made a relevant contribution, like you've already made your first contribution by the time you're accepted to the program, so that's, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so there's a, a lot of these kinds of side effects um, that also will carry through to other mentorship projects you do, like Google Summer of Code. If you, for instance, you might apply to OPW as a project, and then at some later point, you'll be better set up if you want to apply for GSOC in the future. Um, there's an emphasis on manageable agreed upon tasks. 
that would also make good GSOC projects. And you're, if you help interns attend the organization's conference and do lightning talks, you're just enriching everybody because when there's a heterogeneous mix of teachers and learners who have different skill levels, everybody learns from each other and is better off. So talking a little bit, this is the bit where we talk more about what we think is working and we go into more detail on the bits from that previous slide of here's some things that work. Yes, you, inviting populations by name. Right, and this I think goes for the mentors, like I was saying, as well as for the interns. Um, having it be a program that was focused on women made me feel like it was talking to me and inviting me to participate. Um, and I think that's that's just super important if you, um, you if you're self-selecting, if you're sort of predisposed to self-select out of being the default person who should do such things, um, which is a problem I think we currently have in this field, then it's useful to be invited specifically by name. Uh, I have two experiences that I think also speak to this. Um, not as an OPW intern or mentor, but this is a, a pattern, right? That we can yoink out of this context and also recognize as a pattern in other outreach activities. One, Angie Byron, who is now like this mega big honcho cheese person in the Drupal world, like a very, like I believe was, the, was or is the release manager for Drupal 8, um, was a community college student when she heard about Google Summer of Code. And then she thought, oh, I've been wanting to get involved in open source, but I don't know, they all seem really smart. But if this is for students, then they'll be okay with someone who doesn't know very much and someone who makes a lot of mistakes. And so she applied, and that was her first entryway into contributing to open source. Saying, oh, students, itself is a good thing because students don't know everything. Yeah, I agree. Like naming, when I say specific populations yes. by name, it could be any, any sort of category of people that you want to welcome. Yeah, and yeah. the second thing is, I, in uh, 2009, I was working at an open source company and I noticed like, oh, the documentation around this one thing, it could be better. It could, there could be sort of an overview of how developers could use it. I don't know. And uh, I was sort of uncertain that this was a thing that was wanted um, and that I would be okay to write it. And then Gnome Journal, a web magazine, said, hey, we want our next issue to be entirely written by women. And that spoke to me and said, hey, you. I was like, oh, hey, I could, maybe that idea, I could do that thing. And that led to me writing for that issue and then going on to edit Gnome Journal and then going on to do more marketing work with Gnome and so on and so on and, and just thoroughly deepened my involvement in open source. I, I also think that the mentoring one-on-one -on -one connection is good. Um, we both, Suman and, and I both like the idea of apprenticeships where you are um, following another person's work back and forth quite closely. Um, and think that was, um, that's often something that happens in open source, but articulating it and making it explicitly part of the structure is, is really nice. Yeah, we need to counteract, uh, this is a theme that you have already probably heard this morning that you will continue to be hearing throughout this conference. We need to counteract the hurtful myths of oh, open source coders or people who are good at things just spring fully formed from the head of Zeus and already exist. No, like we all started as you know infants and, and had to learn along the way and uh, making sure that we're explicitly making pathways for people to learn lots of different things and to learn them in communities of practice so they can sort of see over each other's shoulders and see other paths uh, actually nurtures everyone and makes it clearer uh, what kinds of possibilities are available for everyone, including people who you thought were already experienced. Uh, I also really think that the um, aspect where you get to meet people in the, in the community and hopefully your actual mentor is a good pattern to follow. Um, it's important that we have this program that crosses national and, and regional lines um, but I think the travel funding is, is super important in this equation mm -hmm. so that we can meet face to face. Yeah, and even if you can't absolutely meet face to face, certainly the try before you buy aspect where me, the people you will be working with are available for you to have 
internet chats with ahead of time is really, really reassuring. Uh, and it allows people to lurk, for instance. You know, in the office hours that we have, people who are thinking about applying can hear the words coming out of my mouth or a mentor's mouth or something like that. And that allows them to get a glimpse of who they would be working with and basically whether they seem like a nice person. Yeah, it was a cool part of the application process that um, for, for this round that I was able to say to the applicants, you can come to our public meetings of my department. Like you can come to the Mozilla QA meetings and we even record them and they're on air Mozilla. You can come to our smaller team meetings. You can look at our, our meeting notes. So a lot of the things happening in public mean that someone who might want to apply can, can make sure that they really would want to work with, work with us. So much in open source, we already have the basis of this built into how we're working transparently in public. We just need to take it one step further and make it discoverable. Do things like actively saying you could come into this meeting or we're holding an office hours where we specifically invite you to come into our IRC channel and talk about this topic. You wanna go ahead? Um, sure. Um, so uh, we also, um, I think we already covered this though. <laughs> right. So yeah, we have, we have the OPW back channel. Um, having a, um, an IRC way to communicate, and an asynchronous and asynchronous way to communicate. So you have your, your real time one and you have your mailing list. Uh, oh, here, the part of this that's important is I think that it's peer to peer. So you're not going through a central um, moderation list. You can talk to other OPW um, interns, you can talk, applicants can talk to interns, applicants can talk to applicants, so you can kind of discuss amongst yourselves and get information from something that isn't the people running the program who are going to be your, your mentors or your bosses or your teachers. Which is important simply on the face of it because it does increase the throughput and it's also important in helping new people get into the culture of open source, which is that anybody can be the expert on these facts. Yeah, and in, in these patterns, I think I'm not suggesting that OPW does them perfectly, Certainly. but they're the things that I think we can take out that are working to one degree or another, and we can apply them as sort of design patterns or a pattern language to other areas. So um, one of those principles is nothing um, about us without us, which is a, actually a disability movement slogan, as far as I know, is its origin. Um, but the idea that it's like, for women and mostly by women um, is important, um, I think, because it increases the level of trust, um, in theory, <laughs> possible. So, for example, in disability history, um, there are activist organizations that set a policy that the organization cannot be governed by more than a certain percent of able-bodied people because then they're not going to be represented by the population they're in, in theory serving. So here I feel like it's great that the, the outreach program for women is, you know, basically it's run by women and um, quite a lot of the mentors are women, although not all. Yeah. 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 It's uh, There's kind of a critical mass. Yeah. 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 It, uh, the, the ally work that's being done is definitely in a support role. Uh, by the people who are not the targets of the program. Right, yeah. so if you were going to try to start an organization for people of color in open source, it would probably be you know, an anti-pattern to, <laughs> it would be maybe a, not a great idea to start it as a bunch of white people, yep. for example. Just tossing that out there. And I think uh, so much of the time in hiring and in trying to find people who could come into open source, we think about this idea of cultural fit. I think uh, stuff is blog, uh, bouncing around the blogosphere right now about the toxic culture of startup hiring and how cultural fit is a phrase that ends up glossing over a bunch of biases. Uh, and instead of trying to find people out in the non-open source world who would already fit in fine just as they are into our world, just as we are, um, consider validating existing personal connections and thinking, huh, who would be interested possibly if there could be a little bit of give on both sides? Yes, I think this is important and sometimes overlooked. 
Um, I've had people talk to me about diversity in their organizations or conferences and say, I can't get any women or any you know X category of people to come speak at my conference. And then I start thinking and like leading them to think through who do they already know who they haven't invited, you know, and their answer is sort of, well, but that person doesn't quite fit in this way or that person already knows about it and hasn't ever applied. And it makes a big difference to encourage people to reach out to the people they do know. The other part of this that really made me think was um, things I've overheard where people are putting down other people's personal connections and saying, well, that person, they, they seem like they're getting contributors, but actually I know it's just like they're friends from college. Like, and I think, why, why does that make it invalid? Like, <laughs> it doesn't at all. So if you look at anyone who starts a company or people who work together, they often knew each other beforehand. That some people's existing personal connections are validated and some people's are considered to be evidence that they're somehow not legit. So that's something to be aware of and question in ourselves. Another thing that works in OPW, and this speaks to it's okay if you're not a student, it's okay if you want to do something other than code, is our built-in openness to different paths, different histories that people have brought to this moment, different careers, different strengths. I think that my intern, Francis, has a path that's brought her to open source and gives her a tremendous number of strengths that I don't have. Uh, involving uh, an ability to jump into new stuff and set herself up for success in um, a way that mixes uh, systematic sort of creating of here are the resources that I need in order to be successful, but then also uh, the willingness to jump in and, and ask questions. And, and this is something like that, that specific mix is something that I don't see as often as I'd like and in, in you know, the people that uh, are in the open source community. I'd love to see more of a combination of, yes, opportunistic learning, but also making sure you set yourself up for success by making sure you have the right resources to start. Um, and different careers, the different perspectives that people have brought in, um, because OPW is OK with you don't know how to code yet if you ever will, we're just opening ourselves up so much more to people who have come in with a bunch of different careers, a bunch of different backgrounds, a bunch of different perspectives and strengths. Yeah, or again, taking away that you have to either be a student or have just, you know, be a recent student. Mm -hmm. that, that is, I think, helpful. Yeah. Um, this is the same slide. We thought we would repeat it. Um, it sums up yeah. some of those points we think are unique and good. As a reminder, we'll be putting this up later, so then this is the slide that you can <laughs> just be like, hey, colleague. Yeah. So what's next? The second half of our title. <laughs> what it is and what's next. This is where we jump back to some things that Outreach Program for Women is aware of and is thinking about, different intersections that we need to be hitting. Well, we've moved the needle on women in GSOC. As we hoped, OPW existing also causes more women to think about doing summer internships and to be aware of Google Summer of Code. So we believe we've helped create this steady upward tick in the percentage of women in Google Summer of Code. And that also wasn't accidental in that people who applied for OPW were also encouraged directly sometimes to, to apply for GSOC as well. Absolutely. There is a program that Google Open Source Programs Office also runs called Google Codein that takes place over like November through January-ish and is for people 13 to 17 years old. And there are top 10 winners each year, and in 2013, 2014 combined, there's only been one who was female. We're not okay, we're not happy with that. We wanna up that. So let's, we, uh, there are lots of thoughts around about connecting various pipelines together, because there are already various initiatives. We don't need to reinvent the wheel on helping girls learn how to code, helping kids get interested in open source, like Black Girls Code and 2040, and helping people in general get into open source, like OpenHatch. So we can connect that all together, maybe. Right, like the finishing mission for a girls coding thing could be one of, you know, you could hook into OpenHatch training missions, you could come up with open source projects. Um, and then maybe get into Google code in that winter break. Right. Maybe. 
So then, that's our idea, anyway. That's some thoughts, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Some this thoughts. this is all in the like hmm thought bubble kind of part of the talk. <laughs> um, let's talk about education and class. Currently, the stats uh, I'll summarize here are that when you look at OPW participants from, for instance, 2013, a lot of them had some kind of college education or even master's uh, or, or other graduate education. And we'd like to be spreading wider to people who did not necessarily go to college. Sorry, where are we at? Uh, you're hitting the next. Next, excellent. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, you might want to consider showing up at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning for awesome organ music and Lucas Black's keynote on Project Ascend, which I'm pretty excited about. Do you want to talk a little bit about Ascend? Um, I, I don't remember the exact description, but it is both naming and welcoming specific groups of people and open to vast to a broad array of people to do participate in this program, which is I think six weeks, is that correct? Uh, six week long program um, for contributing in open source. And they're paid during that period. Yeah. It's especially meant to, to hit classism. And who's sponsoring it? Mozilla. Mozilla. Mozilla, go Mozilla. <laughs> Thank you, Mozilla. Thanks. Yeah. Great, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I am especially, uh, there, there's uh, classism in open source, and I hate it, and I hate that I've benefited from it, and I would like to be working on breaking down classism. So that's another thing that I'd love to be talking with you about over the rest of the conference, and maybe we can have a Friday unconference thing. And uh, my specific things I'm really thinking about right now are outreach to community colleges. Radio Shack, AKA where, at least in the US, a lot of working class, tech savvy, gadget interested people are, and the military, like veterans and stuff like that, where there's a lot of smart folks who would like to be doing more with tech skills. Oh, didn't we have a slide for me? That's later. Oh, it's later, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so participation by country is another access we'd like to kind of look at, I mean, you see that there's a lot of folks from the US, India, uh, Brazil, and so on and so on. And then it gets kind of long tailish in uh, Outreach Program for Women and Google Summer of Code and also the uh, open source survey of participants from last year. Yes? You are quite right. You are right. Sorry, I'm only focusing on deficiencies. Urgh, but you're absolutely right. It is good to have high population countries like India and Brazil up there in the top three. So since we have about five minutes left and we have a bunch of can we save really that till quick. Friday? <laughs> and we do want to talk about the country issue. But yeah, there's a lot of lack of participation by a lot of countries that we would like to hit, including, uh, for instance, like Pakistan and uh, Cyprus and uh, Indonesia and Hong Kong, other places where we know there are tech people, right? So we are interested in talking also here at OSB and later about especially what's happening outside the G8 countries so that we can, again, connect pipelines. There's already people on the ground in those places doing interesting work. We got to connect it all up instead of, you know, coming in, ah, yes, I am American. I will sell as your problem. That works so well in other places. All right. <laughs> um, people of color in the US. Um, so I am Asian American. In a sense, I should not be talking about this because Asian Americans are super overrepresented in US STEM. We are under 10% of the US population, but people of Asian descent are something like 30% of the programmer jobs in the US, according to uh, the most recent census. Um, but then uh, we don't have stats for free software participation, and we know anecdotally that. There are underrepresented groups like African Americans, Latinos, and uh, people of Native American descent that are super underrepresented in open source. So there are some pipelines. Again, let's, uh, let's work on connecting those up. It's just a few of the ones we know about are, uh, of pipelines are Black Girls Code, the Kapoor Center Fellowships, and May 1st People Links, People of Color Techie Training Program that trains people to be sysadmins. Yeah, lots more of them. Um, the one of them I think about is um, uh, disabled people in open source. I think it's um, open source tech and culture is especially powerful and something that 
that dis disability politics could really start incorporating as a core value. Um, and then um, I would love to see there be programs that specifically explain, you know, that these are jobs that, that you could do as a disabled person. I think about maybe I should explain my job. You know, I, I can do a lot of things asynchronously. If I get exhausted, I can work a little more later. Nobody's gonna notice. I can work from home. A lot of my colleagues are all over the world. So, um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a great job. And there are a lot more great jobs in open source for people with disabilities or chronic illnesses. So now we have about three minutes left. And so this is where we really pound you with how you can help. Uh, talk with us over the rest of OSB and during the Friday Unconference about all the issues that we've brought up. Also, talk to us and Marina. Will you stand up? Okay. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Marina. Um, if people like you are underrepresented in free software, spread the word about OPW. We, uh, on the OPW site, there are flyers. There are sample tweets. There are pictures. We make it easy. Um, you can apply to participate. You can become a mentor. You could get your organization to offer internships. How much does an individual internship cost, Marina? Six thousand two hundred fifty U.S. dollars, and for that bargain price, do you know how much great PR you get, uh, and a wonderful intern, and a bunch of the side effects that we mentioned earlier? The other thing you could do is take some of these ideas and some of the patterns we tried to abstract out, um, and apply them in whatever open source work you're doing. And if you want to, you can just give OPW money. I mean, you don't have to actually run an internship program. You could just give OPW, just donate some money at them. That would also work. We would be happy with Tell that. your rich friends. Tell your rich friends, yeah. Um, so yeah, please do borrow these patterns. Thank you. I think that's the end. Uh, oh, Is that, uh, wait, 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 let's set up the oh. Friday discussion. Sorry. Jeez. Go back to the Friday discussion slide. Yes, so here are some things that we also especially want to talk about in the Friday discussion. How do we replicate the OPW model to fight other isms? Uh, classism, racism, and uh, uh, ableism, sexism, uh, more other uh, sexism that I don't know about. Um, how can we get the money to get more projects involved? I work for a nonprofit, the Wikimedia Foundation. You know, it takes money to run these internships, and we don't have one big funder. Um, if a big funder wanted to give tens and tens of thousands of dollars, that would help out a lot. And what do interns do after OPW? How do we improve that off-ramp? That's especially something that I'm interested in as career development advisor. So those are things I'd love to talk with you about, especially during a Friday on conference session. That's actually the end. Good. Thanks. Thanks.